<laughs> and we're live. Woo oh, nice. Record, uh, recording happens automatically, it looks like. Yay! Hello. Hey, Jeannie. Oh my gosh, hey, Serena. Thank you all for joining us tonight. We're excited to get into some drip irrigation conversations. Before we get started, uh, we're, we're going to give it a few minutes for folks to trickle in. But for those of you who are joining us, maybe if you want to drop in the chat where you're joining us from or what you'd like to learn today, that would help us get a sense of who's in the audience. Santa Rosa, nice. Again, thank you all for being here tonight and signing on a little bit early. We're going to give it Probably just another minute. Oh, nice. We have Nolan hoping to learn how to put together a quick and simple system for their raised beds. Raising my own veggies. Initial installation on raised beds. All right. Common theme already. You guys are sending messages. Make sure to change it to everybody so everyone can see all your cool responses. Oh, great point, Serena. Yeah, when you're in the chat box, if you see that two button, there's a drop down to send to all panelists. If you go ahead and click all panelists and attendees, then everybody will be able to see your responses. Little Zoom etiquette there. I think we'll give it just another minute. Sounds good. I'm going to represent my town right now. Healdsburg. <laughs> I forget you're in Healdsburg, Chris. <laughs> nice. Well, if we, I'm sure people will be joining us all throughout the webinar, but maybe for time's sake, we go ahead and get started. Sounds like a great idea. Okay, everybody, welcome to tonight's webinar called Diving into Drip Irrigation with our special guest, Chris Loomis. This webinar tonight is brought to you in collaboration with Daily Axe, the city of Katahdi, and Sonoma Water as well. Let's get started. So before we totally dive in tonight, I wanted to give you guys a little bit of background on Daily Axe. Daily Axe is a holistic education nonprofit that takes a heart-centered approach to inspiring transformative actions that create connected, equitable, and climate resilient communities. We really do believe in the power of our daily actions to reconnect people to self, community, and place, which helps heal our society and our planet. We spread solutions and models that offer skills, tools, and resources to conserve resources while growing food, medicine, habitat, and community. Because change happens through mindful collaboration, we also invest in strengthening community leadership by equipping leaders who understand the interrelations of social, economic, and environmental justice issues throughout our networks, alliances, and leadership programs. And then the last part of what we do is building political and public will by mobilizing our community's power towards environmental justice and climate justice policies. Our impact over the last 18 years has been to create solutions and models that ripple through our community, catalyzing action and supporting leaders to boldly advocate for a brighter future. Daily Acts in the last 18 years has implemented over 1,400 different programs, 
built civic engagement through our leadership programs, in installed dozens of demonstration gardens for fire survivors, homeless veterans, schools, and more. And we've also launched new coalitions and programs to support the environmental health needs of vulnerable populations in the last five years due to record drought, flood, and fire. Before we totally dive in, I wanted to go over a couple of Zoom etiquette things. First, make sure to use the chat box to share statements with the whole group. Make sure that you have it set to everybody and not just panelists so everyone can see your cool thoughts and ideas. Additionally, if you have questions for Chris or questions for us about anything you see in this PowerPoint tonight, make sure to use the question and answer box. This will help us track your questions and make sure all of your really important questions get answered. Don't worry if your question doesn't get answered in between sections. We've also set aside time at the end of the webinar to answer your questions as well. I wanted to give you guys a quick introduction to your webinar host tonight. Chris, you wanna give us an introduction? Okay, hi everybody. My name is Chris Loomis and I live in Healdsburg and I work for Sonoma Water. Um, I've been there for about three and a half years in the water conservation department. Prior to that, I worked for Wyatt Irrigation for 21 years. So I had a, a lot of uh, landscape irrigation and agricultural irrigation experience. I've also seen it all. I, um, most of my formal learning took place by people walking in and sharing their mistakes and, and their troubles and figuring out how that happens. So when you figure out how problems happen, you figure out how to avoid them in the first place. So um, I've had a passion for irrigation for over 25 years. So I went out and got my certificate in irrigation design. I also love solving problems. So having a certificate in landscape irrigation auditing is also pretty cool because you get to kind of be a detective and sleuth things out and figure out um, how to make corrections. I'm also a qualified water fish and landscaper certified and I'm also an instructor and teach landscape irrigation at Santa Rosa Junior College and Mendocino College and very excited to talk about something I'm very passionate about. So thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. And then Liz, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure, thank you. My name is Liz. I'm a senior programs coordinator with Daily Axe, and I am just thrilled to be able to be part of this panel and just learn from Chris, as well as like she mentioned from all of you and lessons learned are always better shared. So thank you all for being here and definitely thank you to Chris and Serena for putting this together. Of course, sorry for that little jump there. And then last but not least, my name is Serena. I am also a programs coordinator at Daily Axe and I'm very excited for tonight's presentation. I actually have a minor in irrigation studies from Cal Poly University and Liz and I both had the pleasure of getting a uh, qual certified through Chris's class. So we're both really looking forward to tonight's presentation. Tonight, uh, our webinar is gonna cover a few different subjects, but I just wanted to give you guys a general idea of what we'll be covering. Uh, first, we're gonna talk about a brief history of where our water comes from, because that's important. Then we're gonna go over some different system components just to get you guys really comfortable and familiar with the different aspects. We're also gonna talk about soil texture and infiltration rate, water budget, uh, just as an, a brief introduction. Um, and then also talk about some next steps, whether you feel comfortable installing this irrigation system on your own or give you some different options to further your own education or some options to hire other people. And then finally, uh, some time for question and answers. So without further ado, Chris, I'll let you get started. Okay, great. I'm gonna go ahead and get my presentation going here. So before we get into the nitty gritty of all the awesome uh, drip irrigation supplies, we need to talk a little bit about where we get our water from. And I took the time to kind of glance over who was going to be attending tonight and I was very pleased to see that the majority of the people that are here are actually share a watershed with me. So that's really cool. So um, I'm gonna share this short video with you that talks about Sonoma Waters um, system. Also, it will, um, I'm gonna follow up with a little bit more after that about why we're concerned about water right now and, and how drip irrigation can help with that. Um, there's no sound on this video. I'm going to try to breeze th through it really quick. Um, it's less than two minutes. Um, also, our sponsor, City of Katati, this is relative to their water supply as well. So i um, excited to share this video with you.
Okay, so this is talking about tap water, but this is also irrigation water unless it's a commercial property or a, um, agricultural application that has reclaimed water. This is where we get our water, Lake Mendocino and Lake Sonoma, which is also fed from Lake Pillsbury and the Upper Eel River. This is talking about how we re, uh, monitor and, and release water. And it's important to keep the balance between nature and customer demand and trying to keep enough water flowing for the fish when they need it and also holding enough back to make sure that we have enough water for the fish when it's time for them to need it. So um, here we are. This is actually a really cool demonstration of these six collector wells that we have. Um, I've been up there to visit these and they're massive. They're really, really cool. And the way that they operate is um, the water is filtered actually completely by nature through sand and gravel through these um, deep um, pit wells um, next to the Russian River and collecting ponds. So our water is tested on a very regular basis and to make sure that everything is exactly right. And um, this kind of shows the, the system and, and all of the different tanks that we have and all of the different directions they go. We have these seven booster stations. So if we need to push water uphill, we can. Um, and when we need to push water uphill, because there's a larger demand, then there's more energy that's consumed to do that. So um, Sonoma Water supplies water to about 600,000 homes. So it's important that we keep everything uh, neat and tidy and working just right. Okay, so this next slide. So one situation that we have going on right now is a temporary urgency change petition. And what that is, is some people may have seen in the news that some of the water flow has been, um, been reduced to the river. And um, some people understand what the goal is and some people don't quite understand. They, they see the river doesn't have as much water in it and they go, this is a bummer. I wish I had more water in the river so we can go play in the river um, and take my family and my dog and my boat and have some fun. So what's happening right now is we, we need to reduce the water in the river. First of all, it's the third driest rainfall year on record for especially the upper watershed area in Mendocino County. So we need to keep as much water back to make up for that. Um, the low rainfall means there's gonna be lower lake levels in both Lake Mendocino and Lake Pillsbury. The low lake levels in Lake Pillsbury has forced PG&E who operates uh, the operations at Lake Pillsbury to cut back on the amount of water they release. So that affects how much water is released into Lake Mendocino. And then it all trickles down to us down here. So without implementing this temporary urgency change, then we, we would be in a very critically low situation by fall if we just let things flow like they normally do. So by us squeaking it back and holding some of that precious resource back, um, there's a couple things that are happening. We're holding back enough water so that we can have enough cold water to release later down the river um, for the migrating Chinook salmon and to make sure that they've got everything that they need so that they can successfully um, continue their cycle. So um, we also need to make sure that we have enough water for the fall in case we don't get rain because it was the third driest year. We don't want a fourth drier year. So we're asking people to conserve. Drip irrigation is a great way to do it and it's also a fun way to do it. So now that we've got all that business taken care of, um, I'm very excited to get going. Okay, so here are some things that you might wanna ask yourself when you're thinking about, okay, a drip system. What do I need to be prepared for? So one question you wanna ask yourself is like, what kind of climate do I live in? Okay, if you're all from here, you know that it's cold in the winter, it's warm in the summer, and we don't have any summer rain. Some places have summer rainfall and irrigation isn't as important for them because if it rained once a week here, we really wouldn't be so concerned as we are now. The other question is what kind of soil do you have? So if you have really sandy soil, that's gonna, um, that's gonna tell us how fast you need to put the water down. It's also gonna tell us how long the soil is gonna hang on to that water once you do put water down. Do you have any slopes? So if you, have a, if you live on a hill or if you live on a flat piece of land, that might also change things a little bit. So if you're using a sprinkler system and you're spraying it onto a slope, it's gonna go downhill and it's gonna start running off. So that's something just to kind of keep in mind. 
Um, and then what kind of plants do you have or what kind of plants do you want? It depends. Are you going to irrigate a, a landscape you already own or are you starting from scratch? So those, it's really great when you start, start from scratch to know how to do this because you want to group your plants together in a way that they all get the same amount of water that they need. So you're not putting high water use plants right next to a low water use plant and trying to irrigate them at the same time. And then I say, what, what size landscape do you have? So some people are talking about raised beds for their garden. So that's probably a fairly small, um, a small piece of land, not a giant farm. Could be, I'm not sure. But um, the bigger your landscape is, the more important that it's accurate. Because if you're going to waste water at all in a small piece of land, you're wasting a small bit of water. But if you have a really big landscape and you just kind of willy-nilly put stuff in, then what you're going to have is a lot of water waste. So you want to make sure that the, the bigger the landscape you have, the more attention to detail that you spend getting it just right. Okay, so it looks like we have a poll question. Okay, so if everybody wouldn't mind just clicking the box that best represents their answer here. So the question is, how much experience do you have with drip irrigation? This is gonna help me guide this conversation tonight. And um, if everybody said fairly extensive, then I would take my conversation up a couple notches. If people are like, I've never seen a drip emitter in my life, then I know where I need to go here. Okay, so go ahead and fill that out. And um, I'm assuming when you ladies will blast that up there when it's done. Yep, we'll give it a few more seconds here. We okay. have 83% of people voted. Okay, great. All right, I'm gonna end this poll and launch those results. We have no experts here. Okay, whew, pressure's off me here. All right, here we go. <laughs> okay, so it looks like some, most people, two thirds of everyone here has at least dabbled in drip irrigation before. So that means a couple things in my mind is that you've put it in and you're frustrated or you put it in and you're not sure or you put it in, but you want to take your skills up just a little bit more. And then the ones that are not at all, great, welcome. This is awesome. We're going we're gonna to be able to take care of everybody here. Okay, so we're going to go to the fun stuff now. So here's the fun stuff, okay? So some of you may already have some of these things. Some of you are probably like, oh my gosh, what is that stuff? Okay, so I'm going to... Um, I'm going to try to be able to share my magic wand at this point and see if this works. Ladies, can you see my red magic wand? Okay, perfect. Okay, so I'm just going to kind of walk through these parts a little bit and we're going to kind of come back and forth to these things throughout the seminar. So this first one here is like a, um, I believe this is a, a, a fan sprayer on a stick. It looks kind of like this guy when it's open, only this one is called a shrubbler. And when it opens up, it, you can close it all the way or open it up. Opened up, it's like three foot diameter. So they get pretty big. Um, and so the, the higher they're open, the more water they put out too. So these can gobble up a lot of water. So you just have to be a little careful with them. Um, they're not the most efficient one, but they are like the funnest one. So if you're just starting out and you want to try something fun first, and you have a small garden, remember the more efficient, um, the larger the landscape, the more efficient it should be. I'm not advocating anything inefficient, but fun is important, right? So we want to make sure your first trip out of the gate is really fun. Okay, so this is what it looks like on a stake. Um, unfortunately, you're going to need some of these too. These are called goof plugs, but you know what? They're super cheap and they're great. If you poke a hole and you put something in the wrong spot, or you poke a hole and you put in a, a dripper, emitter, sprayer, and it does not do what you thought it was gonna do, you can pull it out and put in a goof plug. So this is a cheap um, way to fix your mistakes. It's three cents a mistake, you think of it that way. Um, these are micro sprinklers. Um, micro sprinklers with drip are not super efficient, and I'm gonna tell you why, because it's for drip, right? So for drip, that indicates you're trying to go to a small area. Otherwise, you wouldn't be using drip. So when you're trying to spray a small area, these sprinklers can't go very far. They also can't put out very much water. 
So when you're trying to cram water through a little tiny hole, what happens is atomizing. So these sprinklers tend to kind of fuzz out and they don't actually make it to their intended target every time. So if you um, want to use micro sprinklers because you feel it's the best option for you, then what I would say is just don't put them on the same line with any drippers because your micro sprinklers are like a really dark black cloud over your garden, just pouring water down hard like rain, where drip emitters are like a little soft puffy cloud and they're only putting out a little bit of rain. So if you are going to use both of them in your landscape, just don't put them on at the same time on the same zone, okay? This little yellow guy is a hole punch. You're gonna need one of those. Um, the yellow one's nice because it's cheap and you can see it. You're gonna lose a million of these if you only get black ones. So keep that in mind. Um, and these emitters right here um, have been popular forever. They're called flag emitters. A lot of people think this is a little valve on the top. It's not. That is so you can open it up and clean it. They used to only be black. So it was really hard to tell what flow rate they are. Now they're color coded, but also everybody makes them. So everybody makes their own color. So you gotta be careful with those guys. Um, these are made from Agrifem. This is their older style, um, but they are pressure compensating emitters. And the color is usually indicative of what the flow rate is. So for this particular series, a red one is half a gallon an hour. The black is one gallon per hour and the green is two gallons per hour. So you can't just go, oh, I can't find any red ones. I'm just gonna poke in a green one. So you have to be really careful about that because you know two gallons an hour versus half a gallon an hour is quite a bit more water. So you just have to be careful. Um, this one right here um, is, is called a woodpecker emitter. Um, and on this coast, everybody knows what I'm talking about in agriculture, but I learned um, at a convention recently when I said woodpecker, everybody looked at me like I was crazy. So it has like a barbed outlet on it. And that is so you could put what they call spaghetti tubing on the end of it if you want um, or not, you don't have to. Okay, so these are just some little goodies down here. This is if you wanted to run the spaghetti line along say a fence or something or along a wall and you just need to tack it up. Here's a T in case you need to go more than one direction. Here's an elbow if you need to make a sharp turn maybe into a pot. And then here's a connector that will take you from standard drip tubing to the spaghetti line so you can get where you want to go. This one right here is an inline emitter tube and we're going to talk about that a little bit more. Along with this glorious looking guy right here, this is also inline emitter tubing where it actually has the emitter built inside of the tube and they are integrated at regular intervals and also um, predictable flows so you can pick them out exactly the way you want. Okay, this little guy right here is a filter. And this little guy right here is a regulator. They kind of go hand in hand, they're like buddies. So you wanna put your filter first when you can because you wanna filter out junk from your regulator. Hang on really quick, I'm gonna be right back. Sorry about that, that was my hot tub coming on. It was gonna be loud for a minute. Okay, so back to filters. So the filters filter out junk, right? So a lot of people go, well, I've got city water and you've promised me my water is delicious and clean and ready to go. And that is true. However, stuff happens sometimes. Um, people run into fire hydrants, people break pipes with shovels. So um, when that happens, sometimes a little bit of dirt gets mixed up and you don't want it to make it through into your system and clog up the little tiny holes in these emitters. So even if you have city water, it's a good idea to have a filter. Pressure regulators are a good idea because you never know what you're gonna have. Um, here in Hillsburg at my house, I have between 60 and 65 PSI. And that's great for taking a shower, but it's not great for a drip system. So if I don't put a regulator on something here at my house, then things tend to start popping out and flying through the air. So you don't want that to happen. So 20 to 35 up to 40 PSI is a common um, pressure for drip systems. So you wanna kind of calm it down a little bit before you send it out to your system. Okay. Um, 
So here are some more goodies. So these are the fittings and just different types of adapters, shutoff valves, elbows, T's, couplings, that kind of stuff. And this also is different types of fittings that do the same thing. So these type over here are called power lock. They also have ones that are similar. Um, it's called a spin lock. And you basically put the tubing on there and you twist it on and the pipe stays there. So that's kind of handy. These um, compression fittings right down here, those are great too, but um, after a while they kind of, they might hurt your hands a little bit. So some people would rather spend a, a little bit more money and buy the ones that have the spin lock. These are um, drip staples right here. And those are for holding down whatever you need to hold down. Either it's the, the half inch tubing right here or the spaghetti line. Especially if you use spaghetti line, you wanna knock it down and keep it flat to the ground. Okay, ladies, before I move on, are there any burning questions that need to be moved on to? Not just yet. Okay. All right. Now we're going to talk about different ways to connect your drip system. So um, if you're just starting off fresh and you want to come from the hose bib on your house, there are a few components that you need to pay attention to. And I'm going to go ahead and hold it, something up here for you to see it. Basically, I put a timer on this one. So here we have a timer. And here we have an atmospheric vacuum breaker. And here we have a filter. And here, oh, I forgot my pressure regulator. Hang on. There, pretend there's a pressure regulator right here for a second. And then we have an adapter to get out to our drip system. So the order that you put these in is pretty important. And a lot of times people will be like, yeah, but it looks dumb that way, or it doesn't fit great or something like that. But there is a reason why we put things in the order that we put things in. So the vacuum breaker normally would go right onto your hose bib. But if you have a timer, you put it on after the timer. The reason is this little guy can't be under pressure all the time. And this little guy is, so you can't put it here. So here we have a vacuum breaker, what that does is it prevents any water going, getting slurped up and pushed back into your system and possibly contaminating the water. So this prevents that from happening. And if water does try to do it, it will drain out of some vent holes right here. So if you see that happening, it's probably because you're pushing water uphill. Um, this is one style of filter right here and it has a little screen in here that you can pull out and clean. You just turn the system on, kind of hose it off, shut it off and shove it back in there really easy. This one happens to be a 19 pound regulator. So that means whatever water pressure is coming in. So here I have 60 PSI. All the way up to this filter, it's going to have 60 PSI. But as soon as it goes through this little guy, it's going to slow it down. It's going to calm it down so my emitters don't start popping off. And then right here, I have a power lock fitting. And then after that, I would go to my drip tubing from there. So this guy right here, I would just put this on and spin it and away we go, okay? So then another way to connect is if you're going to hard pipe it. So here we have an anti-siphon valve, our filter and our regulator. Now you might look at this filter and go, oh my gosh, it's big, but you know what? It holds a lot. So if you have cruddy water, you want a bigger filter. So this also has a stainless steel filter. They make um, less expensive models. Um, but the stainless steel is pretty nice, so keep that in mind. This is a 20 PSI regulator because it says 20 right on the side. And so here you might be going, you know, in with PVC, out with PVC, and then transitioning to a drip system somewhere later on down the road. So that's another um, part. Um, Brian mentioned um, from Hillsburg that he wants to um, change out his sprinkler system to a drip system. And they came up with this cool guy a while ago. And basically, this is kind of typically the height of an average pop-up sprinkler head. But what's really cool about this guy is inside of this thing, there's a filter. And inside of here, there's a built-in pressure regulator. So you don't have to worry about cutting a bunch of stuff in. So you put this guy in, you screw it in place of a sprinkler head, and you can either go um, both directions or one direction and go out there with your drip system and, and there you go. So also you see um, this image right here to cap them off. 
sometimes these work right, sometimes they just don't fit right. So that's this little guy. And this is called a cap pop. So this one it takes the place of, it, it integrates into your existing sprinkler head so that you don't have to take the whole sprinkler head out. You can just put this contraption in place of the guts that are normally in your sprinkler head. So um, that one, I don't have a link for, but we should um, think about putting one up later. Okay, so also most um, of our retailers um, th through Sonoma Water have turf rebates. So if you replace your turf with low water use plants in a drip system, you can get anywhere from 50 cents to a dollar per square to do that. So that's really cool. Okay. All right, do we have any burning questions before we move on to emitters? We've got a few questions, but I think that we can save them until the end. Okay, great. Okay, so now we're gonna take, talk about types of emitters. So we have pressure compensating emitters and non-pressure compensating emitters. And so what it means is that a pressure compensating emitter says, okay, um, here's an example of one right here. So it says, all right, if you push 10 pounds of pressure through this emitter, I'm still gonna put out the amount of water that I'm supposed to. And if you put 50 pounds of pressure through this emitter, it's gonna put out the same amount. That is, That is this emitter right here. This is its performance curve. So here's its pressure, 10, 10 pounds of pressure, and here's its line of performance. So it puts it out right at one gallon per hour, and at 50 pounds, it does the same exact thing. So that's great. It makes it easy to calculate. That's why you see these types of emitters right here in agriculture, is because you can't afford to put them in a vineyard and have you know one flow at one end of the row and another flow at the other end of the row. You would have vineyards that look great on one end, not the other. So um, this up here is an example of a non-pressure compensating emitter. So this one here, this one gallon example, when you give it 10 pounds, it puts out a gallon. But if you give it 50 pounds, it puts out one and three quarters gallons. So you can see where that's not super consistent. So um, you wanna make sure that if you, especially if you have an extensive irrigation system or you have a very long run, like a long line, or if you have a lot of elevation changes, that you go ahead and, and get the pressure compensating emitter. And honestly, they're really not that much more expensive. And sometimes because they buy so many, they're the same price as the less expensive option. If you have a really small uh, landscape and you don't have a lot of elevation changes, everything's pretty close together. You probably don't have a giant pressure fluctuation. So you can get away with um, a non-pressure compensating emitter. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you an example of a non-pressure compensating emitter. So first I'm gonna back up just a tad because people would ask me, what's your favorite emitter? Okay, so the answer is never clear cut. It depends on, I say, well, what's your water like? So if somebody says, I have super cruddy water, then I'm really hesitant sometimes to give them an emitter that has a labyrinth built inside of it to, for consistency that could get clogged up if you put cruddy water in there. Okay, so this emitter is not pressure compensating. It does have a fairly large variance in flow, but what it does have is the ability to clean it and not all of these have that ability. If this one gets clogged up, you smack it with a stick a couple times and if that doesn't fix it, then you abandon it or you cut it out and put in a different emitter. So this guy right here, if he gets clogged up, you turn this top handle and make sure you don't let go or you're gonna get nailed with it. And you just rinse it out and put it back together and away you go. So if somebody has really cruddy water, this might be my favorite emitter. It just depends on a couple of things. Um, I would play this video for you. Um, actually, I will. But you hear that sound? That's terrible, right? So I'm gonna turn that off. That was my 60 PSI squealing. So basically I ran the system for 30 seconds and I collected how much water came out of this emitter. And I did two tests, one with it under regulation and one not. So here are the results. So here we have 18 milliliters about in this container in 30 seconds when I had it regulated with that 19 pound regulator you saw earlier. And when I didn't have it regulated, 
it was almost exactly twice as much water. It was right around 36. And I was like, whoa, that's actually pretty cool that it worked out that way. But so the difference was 19 pounds or 60 pounds and the performance was like, whoa, okay. So when I did the math of what is that actually, it was 0.57 gallons per hour or 1.14. So this is considered a half gallon emitter. And it's actually kind of rare that they make this flag emitter in half a gallon. But you can see where um, if you were looking for pure efficiency, consistency, and you know exactly how much water is coming out of that thing, then you need to make sure you at least regulate it so that you have um, a little bit more control over that. Okay, so then we're gonna talk about some um, inline emitter tubing and the pros and cons of using it. So a lot of people really love this stuff. So this is the Everflow um, Agrifem emitter tubing. It comes in two different spacings. It has holes built in, or excuse me, emitters built in either every six inches like this one or every 12 inches. So these can be good for the people that we're talking about raised beds. Um, I have this in one of my raised beds and the good thing about it is it's easy. It's super easy. If I go to harvest everything, I can just peel it back, do whatever I need to do, and then next year I can lay it back down again. But what I realized is that how often do you use native soil in your raised beds? A lot of people import their soil or buy bagged soil for that. So what does that mean? It's normally a little bit more coarse which means there's a lot of pore spaces in it. So if you start applying water um, slowly, what happens is water just goes straight down. So you wanna make sure that you get something pretty tight together and then you might have to put your rows close together, somewhat close together, so that they're not really stretched out when you run it through. So the disadvantages of this tubing is one, it's limitation on how far you can go. So because this is only a quarter of an inch, you can't blast a lot of water through there. So here in this example, the six inch spacing, you can only run it for about 20 feet. The 12 inch spacing, I believe is, they say 36 feet. So that's the, the total length that you can run from, from beginning to end and plugging off the end. So if you needed to go farther than that, then you would have to get creative. Okay, the other thing it does is it's not pressure compensating. That's one reason why you can't run it for very far, right? Is here we show the 10 PSI is 0.39 gallons per hour per one of these. And then if you have 30 PSI, it's 0.69. So that's why if you try to overextend this tubing, it's gonna poop out at the end and you're not gonna have great performance. So you wanna stick to those um, boundaries that they give you. The other thing is, we're gonna talk a little bit more about check valves in a minute, but I'm gonna do it right now anyway. So what a check valve does is it helps with a couple of things. One is it holds water inside of the tubing so that if you had a slope, it doesn't just all drain out the end when the system shuts off. It basically has like a, think of it as being spring loaded and you need to like push the door open to get water out of the tube. So that's what a check valve does. The other thing it helps with is it doesn't slurp in air when the system shuts off. So a lot of times with drip systems, you'll hear that when the system shuts off, you hear all kinds of little uh, squeaking sounds and things like that. And it's trying to draw air back into the line sometimes. And what that can do is when these guys slurp in air, they can also slurp in dirt. So you need to um, keep that in mind. So you can't bury this stuff. You can put it under mulch, but still it might draw in some stuff. So it's better on top of bare soil. And so that's one more reason why I'm not super crazy about it, but for be vegetable beds, this stuff is pretty cool. Okay, anything before I go? Okay, here we go. So this one is called TechLine. CV stands for check valve. This is a quick install guide. This is where we could share the NetFM design guide. Um, also probably want to share the Agrifem Smart Watering Guide. That will get them to this book right here. Okay, so the NetFM Design Guide will get you down a technical road that you might not be ready for, but it has lots of ideas and ways of um, hooking this up and a better understanding of how it works. 
But basically, this is called the light layout. And the light layout means that it's not a huge garden, um, something like maybe 300 square feet. So it has a single entry, and then this tubing kind of wraps around in a regular spacing, and then it has a, a single outlet somewhere in the hydraulic middle. So wherever halfway is, that's where they have a flush valve. And that's just in case any crud gets in there, you wanna be able to get it out. So the cool thing about this, as you can see in this illustration, is that because it has built-in emitters um, at predictable spacing, that the idea is that it will put water out and then the lateral movement of water will bring all of those spaces together and the entire area will be wet. And that's great if you have a landscape that is um, planted pretty densely. If you have a lot of really blank spots, then you might consider using individual emitters instead of inline emitter tubing. But this stuff is great. It's easier to calculate. And if you put it in an, at an interval that you're familiar with, then you might not hit it with a shovel or anything like that. So um, move on to the next thing. This is how it works. So you see over here, I circled this little tiny baby hole over here. So this emitter tubing has emitters built in. This particular guy that I have right here has a hole every 12 inches, okay? It comes in a lot of different spacings and it depends on your soil, what you wanna do. So if you have really sandy soil, then those emitters need to be closer together. If you have really clay soil and water doesn't infiltrate very quickly, you can space those emitters apart and so that water is going to hit the ground and move laterally. So this emitter here has all of this stuff going on inside of it. So that looks expensive, right? Okay, so here's the deal. If you go to just any hardware store to pick up inline emitter tubing and you see a, a, a cheap roll and a more expensive roll, there's a reason why th there's a cheap roll and a more expensive roll. The more expensive roll has all this stuff going on. You wanna pay for quality on this. You don't wanna mess around. You don't wanna pull the stuff up later and do it again. So you wanna buy an inline emitter tubing that has a check valve in it and that's pressure compensating. Because if you don't, it might clog and it won't be um, as efficient. Here is a video of showing you how an inline emitter tubing looks like when it's on. So there's no sound. So I could sing or something right now. I wanted to, but I won't. Okay, so here we go. It's a cartoon, but that's okay. So you see there's holes periodically and the lateral movement of water in the soil brings all of that together and then infiltrates into the soil. So if you had really sandy soil and those holes were too far apart, they might not ever touch. So you've got to make sure you got the right stuff. Okay, so here's a, um, some time-lapse photography of what is going on underneath the soil. Again, so if you want to put it underneath the soil, which you can, you got to make sure you have the right product. And you have to make sure that you know exactly what soil type you have. So that was an illustration of you have a weird shape, you can figure this stuff out, even with weird shapes. And you can see in that illustration, it just eventually fills in. Okay, um, here we have a little bit more on the technical side, down here is an invisible chart that you can't see to the naked eye because it's so small. So I could try to zoom in on this. I'm going to give it a shot. Let's see what happens. Okay. Oh, okay. So let me explain this chart to you just a little bit now that I totally messed up my slide. It's okay. Okay. So here they go. Okay. So are you irrigating turf or are you irrigating shrubs and ground cover? Okay, so this chart can be really intimidating. So you gotta kind of narrow it down first. What are we irrigating? We're irrigating shrubs and ground cover, right? Okay, then what kind of soil do you have? Do you have clay soil? Do you have loam soil? Do you have sandy soil or really coarse soil? There's no such thing as coarse soil in Sonoma County. So you can just pretty much wipe those out right now, right? So we're gonna say, if you're lucky, you have loam soil, right? So let's pretend you have loam soil. So if you have loam soil, they've narrowed it down. You should use an emitter that has 0.4 gallons per hour per emitter hole, right? So that's each one of these guys, 0.4 gallons comes out of this every hour. Okay, so then they say, well, how far apart should you make these emitters? So here they say, if you have loam soil, it should be 18 inches. Okay, that's because you're going to get some lateral movement of that water. So this tubing would not be right. These, this tubing is too close together. 
Okay, so then they're telling you, you have some other choices to make here. So that's how far apart your laterals are. So in this upper illustration up here, this is lateral distance, the distance between one line and the next. That's what they're talking about. So they have three options for you, 18 inches, 21 inches, or 24 inches. So if you choose 18 inches, then it tells you here's how much water you're gonna put down. So in an hour, you're gonna put down about three tenths of an inch of water. So think about how big that is. That's how much water is going to come down and spread out in an hour. And if you wanted less than that, then you would pick a wider spacing. Then they're so generous to tell you how long it'll take you to put a quarter of an inch of water down. So you can see where this chart is a little like, oh, intimidating, but you just gotta narrow it down to the little nitty gritty that you need it for, okay? And if that scares you, then um, we'll talk about that some more. Okay, so here, let me zoom back out, there we go. This is the type of connections they have for this tube. They do make other type of connections that have the twist locks. And I'm just gonna be totally honest right now. See that coupling right there? There's no way I wanna put that all the way in. It hurts. So um, that's where, you know, if you have a rubber mallet, this little baby right here is really helpful with this kind of fitting, but still it's super tight, but you don't want these to pop off. So you can't mess around, okay? So plan your garden well. That light version, I'm gonna scooch back up to it right now so you can see what I'm talking about. They know these fittings are not fun. Look how many fittings there are. There's two, right? There's one to get in the tube and there's one to get out of the tube. They already knew that. They knew you're gonna hate putting these fittings in. so. They're like, okay, you're gonna hate this, so I'm only gonna make you do it a couple of times. So that's your variety of fittings. Okay, so now if you came here today for some fun or you're going to be doing your raised beds, this might be the time for you. This is a little project that I did for my neighbor. She put in these little half barrels and I said, hey, can I try to use my really inadequate videography skills to videotape what I'm doing for you. And they were so generous to let me do that. The problem is there was dogs barking, jackhammers going, lawnmowers going. So it's a little sketch, but I think you'll get the gist of it. So this is a really simple project that you can take on if you're ready to just take a little small dive and try something out. So here we go. There is no sound for part of this. So this is how to install a simple wine barrel system. Here are the, su the supplies that you need. And later you can pause this and go back and really investigate some of these parts. Okay, here we have our timer, backflow preventer, filter, regulator, and adapter, just like I kind of showed you earlier. This guy right here, the um, rubber mallet. You gotta have one of these. If you use a hammer, it's gonna be messed up. Okay, down, there it comes. Not a lot of sound, jackhammer, hear that? Okay, so there, I laid the line down behind the barrels, I stapled it down, I flushed the line out because who knows what happened on the way there. Now these are the supplies that you need per barrel. I'm gonna go back because you wanna see that part. Okay. So what we have are two spectrum sprayers. Those are those ones that fan out. This guy right here, okay. And then you need a T because you're going to split this tube in half and you're going to need a connector, which actually handy dandy comes with this guy. Okay. And then you're also going to need some of these staples and a little bit of tube. You might not know how much tube you need until you do one. So let's keep going. You'll see what I did here because it's not that I'm smart. It's that I'm lazy sometimes. So I get by. So here I'm connecting into the main tube that I ran behind the barrels. I use my handy dandy yellow punch because I'll lose it if I don't use a yellow one. I've connected the spaghetti tube and now I've brought it up to the pot. And here's my example. I have two of these fan sprayers, some spaghetti tubing that comes all the way around to each other. And you, right here, there's a little T. And so I'm gonna connect that down to where I just hooked up. Okay, let's keep going, it's going here. Okay, so then after I did my first one, I went ahead and just prefabricated them. I went, okay, how long of a piece of tube did I need? 
um, of each in each direction and I sat down and I cut nine of them all at one time so that when I got stuck behind those barrels poking holes that I wasn't sitting there trying to figure all this out later. So if you can get them prefabricated, you're going to save a little bit of time. Okay, so I'm ready to turn this on for the first so time. Here we go. Turn it on. Make sure the faucet was on already and pressurized. Then I'm going to hit the manual button on there. And now we're going to go check it out. Here we have our 10 half barrels with our fan spectrum sprays. Two per pot. You can use one per pot. These two I have turned off. You don't know, it's better to have two because you can just turn one off if you don't need it. Here I'm going to show you how to adjust them. So you can turn these all the way off or you can turn them all the way up and all the way up is pretty far. And there's a fine line between so all that's the way spraying out all the way out of the off. pot. So, so we don't really want that. We're going to dial these down till we get them where we want them and you may have to come along and adjust these periodically depending on where your plants are. And some plants don't like water on their foliage, so you've got to be careful where you put them. Sometimes you can just squish them down farther or lift them up a little bit higher also. So there you have it. Ten half barrels with spectrum sprayers. Okay, this is when my videography skills got really bad. Okay, so here I'm showing you this tool that I developed so that you can take pressure readings on your drip system. Normally for a, a home landscape, you won't need this. But if you ever run into problems with your system, you might need one to be able to tell where the where the problem is. So irrigation auditors, they need to take pressure readings. On okay, now we're going to go down to the beginning of the line. Um, they need to take and pressure do the same thing down here. On each line. So having the we're going to open it up all the way. Um, Liz, do you want to share the link on that one for the drip tool in the chat box? And here it looks like, according to the gauge, that we have about 26 psi. So it looks like we have zero loss pretty much all the way from the beginning to the end. And that's how you use the tool. So I got pretty wet doing that. So this guy right here, basically you push it up against the outlet here and you got to hold it like a seal so that it will pressurize so you can see what you have. So then I snuck over there and took a picture of their eggplant the other day just to see how it was doing. So there you have it. So that's a pretty easy deal. And I'm going to tell you right now, I told a lie in this. I said it took about an hour. There was way more involved in this one than you see because I actually had to jet underneath their sidewalk and dig a little trench and go behind a shed. So without all that stuff, it would have taken me about an hour. Um, not a lot. Maybe it would take a little longer if I wasn't familiar with it. But that's the fun stuff right there. So this is a, an easy project. Um, Daily Axe just handed out all these great garden kits, right? So this would be a perfect time to plug one of those in, would be with those garden kits. You can also use these with the raised beds, um, or you, know, you might want to use that um, brown Everflow tubing. This is a good start, too, and experiment. You don't want to use the two together, though, because these guys put water out pretty darn slow, and these guys right here put out water pretty darn fast. So you don't wanna mix the two together. Okay, I'm gonna try to speed this up a little bit because we got a lot still to go, and we got people burning to ask some questions. So we talked a little bit about soil and um, flow rates, but I just wanna point this out a little bit more. So if you have sandy soil, when water hits the surface, it wants to go to the center of the earth, right? So what does that mean? That means you can't apply it really super duper slow. Because if you apply it super duper slow, it is just going to go ding, 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 ding to the bottom of the earth, right? So you have to apply it a little bit heavier. And that's so that water has time to go in and out on its way down, okay? So if you have loam soil, you can see that as it starts entering the soil, it kind of bulbs out in a nice, beautiful fashion. And I wish we had loam soil here. You might. Okay, clay soil is a little bit more like it. So clay soil, what happens is if you put it down too fast, it just goes that way and it starts running off. So with clay soil, you want to try to apply it pretty slow so that the soil can drink it as fast as you're giving it to it. And that's hard to do. Okay, so we're going to ask another poll question. 
So our question is, how well does the soil drain in your garden? Not very well. After watering events, water pools for hours afterwards. I have a few of those spots at my house. It drains okay. Water pools, but drains in less than an hour. Or I don't have drainage issues in my garden at all. Okay, let's see who's got the perfect soil here or perfect application rate and soil combination. We'll give it a few more seconds until we close this poll. Okay, there we go. Not very well, 12%. I'm guessing that's that Petaluma clay soil, right? Probably. You guys got it going on down there. Okay. So it drains okay, water pools, or I don't have drainage issues in my garden. Congratulations, guys. That's awesome. Okay. So if you remember a minute ago, I talked about the application rate of this irrigation tubing where I blew this up and messed up my slide. This one here. Let's see if I can fix it. Okay. So back to loam soil, and it had an application rate of 0.29 inches per hour. Now, the best way to describe that is rain, okay? It's raining. If you say it rained an inch last night, you go, oh, right? That's a lot of water to rain in one night. If you say my irrigation system is 0.3 inches per hour, that doesn't seem like much, but that's every single hour, right? So if you left it on for 10 hours, that's three inches, okay? We're gonna cruise down now, why that matters. Whoa, okay, back to normal size, maybe slightly bigger. So here's our soil triangle and a little bit of boring stuff, but it's important. Okay, so this is talking about maximum precipitation rates in inches per hour by soil type. So again, think of it as rainfall. How hard can it rain and your soil is sitting there just drinking it up at the same rate? It doesn't happen very often. So if you have coarse sandy soil, which you don't, I know you don't, you can put two inches of rain down an hour and it's gonna just gulp it up the whole time. Okay, let's talk about Petaluma for a minute. Okay, heavy clay or clay loam soil, 0.2 inches per hour. You think about that, that's not very much rain before it starts kind of puddling up and running off. So that emitter tubing earlier was 0.3. Okay, so it's getting close. This soil can drink at two tenths of an inch. We're pouring it on at 0.3 inches. And after a while, it's gonna have too much, but it's a little easier to control than trying to apply it at two inches per hour. So that's not impossible to do with drip, but it's almost impossible to not do if you're using a spray system. A spray system, just a regular pop up and spray, not moving around kind of sprinkler, puts out about an inch and a half of rain in an hour. So you can imagine in clay soil what that's going to look like real quick, right? So if you have a sprinkler system now that you turn on for just even a few minutes and it starts running down the street, that means you need to um, think about a different system, but also consider shorter run times um, and maybe more frequent. Okay, we're going to get out of that boring stuff. The other thing is, just real quick, infiltration rate on different types of soil. Sandy is high, clay is low, water retention. Uh, sandy is very low. It doesn't hang on to water at all. It's not spongy whatsoever. You pour it in, it does its thing, and it goes back out. But clay soil, it might take forever to drink the water, but then it hangs on really tight. And that means that you don't have to irrigate as often, right? So you'll put it down slow, and then you leave it alone for a while, and then you come back and irrigate again. For sandy soil, you got to be like, okay, irrigate, irrigate, irrigate. you got to just stay on top of it. Okay, so here is um, a ribbon test. We might have a link for you on how to do this yourself. I'm not sure. But basically, um, if you don't know how to do a ribbon test, you can even Google it really quick. It's pretty simple. Basically, you just wad up some soil in your hand, give it a little spit or a little bit of water on there, kind of um, work it on in your fingers, and then just kind of push it out and see how far it goes. And if you start pushing that soil out and it just falls right off, you might have loamy sand or sandy loam, but if it just goes on forever, like one of those fireworks snakes that just keeps growing for eternity, then you probably have clay soil. 
So that's one simple way that you can check it out. Now, it doesn't mean you have the same soil throughout your landscape, um, but you probably have very similar soil throughout your landscape. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about climate just a little bit. So here where we are, um, according to the California Irrigation Management Information System, we are in zone five in Katahdi and for a lot of the area around here. So the description for that is Northern Inland Valleys, um, north of San Francisco. So you can kind of see on this map, all kinds of different colors. So the prettier the color, the less water you need to give to your plants. The uglier the color, the more water it's gonna need, okay? So the uglier the color means it's more in a um, dry desert type of climate, okay? I'm gonna try to keep this as simple as I can. So here we have a chart. Here we are right in here, okay? So we're zone five. So this is another one of those charts that if you look at it, you go, ah, okay. You gotta look at just what you wanna look at. So here's zone five. You're looking for the biggest number you can find in this column. Do, 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 do. Here it is, 6.51, that happens to be July. So what does that mean? What that means is if it rained in July and it just sporadically rained throughout the month and it rained six and a half inches of water, you probably would not need to irrigate at all. But that's not the case, that doesn't happen here. So we have to make up for that with irrigation, okay? So if you have a high water use plant, you're gonna have to give it six and a half inches of water, okay? If you have a medium water use plant, you're gonna get away with less. And if you have a low water use plant, you're gonna get away with even less than that. So here I have a couple of different areas that are highlighted and the totals at the end for zone five is about 36 inches of water that you need to give your plants from April to October. So no, you're not gonna go out there with a measuring tape and measure how much water you gave it. So there is a calculation that gets you easily from inches to gallons. So whatever the inches are, you multiply it times 0.62 and that'll tell you how many gallons you need for that period of time to make up for that if you have a high water use plant. So notice at the top of this chart, I have added these percentages. And this is one way that you can keep track of, well, let's see, it's August 1st coming right up, right? Is that tomorrow? Is tomorrow August 1st? Okay. So tomorrow would be a day that you would change your irrigation controller if you had one. Right here it says 91%, July says 100. So I'd go out, change my irrigation controller to 90%. That means it's gonna squeak it down and water less, okay? So that's as simple as I can get that one, okay? So for landscape water budgets, you have to take in uh, account several things. So the weather, you know, what kind of climate do you live in? What kind of plants do you have? Um, the landscape area that it's in, how efficient your system is, and if you have any rainfall to make up for it. So the less efficient your system is, probably the more water you're gonna have to use. So if you have um, say you have a turf area and you have one dry spot. What do you do? You leave it on until the dry spot looks great, right? Well, that means you're using more water overall because you're making up for that stupid dry spot. So you got to train yourself to just dry, to just water the dry spot instead. Okay. So if you're looking for inspiration for plants, there's a, you can give them the um, links for Wolkholz. I have two of them on there, one for Wolkholz 3 and one for Wolkholz uh, 4. Wolkholz 4 is great if you are um, technologically halfway there. You probably get yourself through this one. So I highlighted here on the Wolkholz um, 4 application that um, I, I did this drop down. I picked Katati and I said, I want to look for very low water use plants and I wanna look for ornamental grasses and you hit this button right here and it would show you a list of all the different types of plants. So this is a really cool tool. Um, if you're more of a book person <clears throat> than the older version, um, three is there. And this is really hard to see because it's very small, but basically it outlines in kind of like an Excel form what the water needs are for the plant in your area. For the Seamus region, we're in region one you would look in this column and you would hopefully find something that says VL for very low or L for low, and you'd wanna avoid things that say H for high. And if you do have plants that have different watering needs, you wanna water them separately from each other to make sure that you're not overwatering your low water use plants to make up for your higher or moderates. <clears throat> so here's kind of a, a rule of thumb is that if you have a high water use plant 
and all the water that it needs, a moderate water use plant uses about two thirds of the water than a high one does. And a low water use plant uses about a third of what a high water use plant does. So you wanna make sure they're not on the same valve. Okay, just for a guilty visual right here, this is pretend this is 12 inches by 12 inches because in real life it was. So this is a square foot of turf. So around the Katadi area, kind of even just all around this um, general vicinity, it takes about 25 gallons of water a season from April to October to irrigate that one square, that's it. So it's like five five gallon buckets of water stacked on top of each other is what it takes to irrigate that. And when you think about that, just think about your lawn stacked up with five gallon buckets, five high. That's how much water it takes to water it all year to keep it just right and not over irrigated. So keep that in mind. <clears throat> okay, this little guy is a succulent. I'm not saying you have to plant just succulents or cactus, but just, just for visual purpose, th this is about two and a half gallons per season that it needs versus the 25 gallon turf. And here are a few of Daliac's favorite low water use plants that they have picked out, which are extremely beautiful, lots of color, and just really fun plants. Do you guys want to talk about these at all? Or Serena or Liz, either one of you? You're good? Okay. So, um, all right. And then this is also uh, the sticky monkey flower. You guys love that stuff. These are all just really beautiful plants. They grow really well here. Very showy, lots of color and they don't use a lot of water. So they're in the, the um, go ahead. Serena, did you wanna say something? Yeah, I could say a quick word. Uh, we did get a it. question about this as well, talking about like native plants versus non-native plants and if that's indicated in woo or not. And I just wanted to put in a quick word that while Daily Acts is about all about using California natives, we also love using plants from analogous climates. Uh, for example, that Jerusalem sage in the top right corner is technically a Mediterranean plant that is not native to California. But since, you know, Mediterranean plants come from very similar climate, Jerusalem sage does amazingly well in this climate and just really adds a beautiful pop of color and a nice little honeysuckle touch to all of our model sites. So we love using those sort of plants as well. Thanks, Chris. All right. Yeah, and we're all about native, native or adaptive plants. We know that if you drive around in the summertime and you see something flowering that's beautiful in nature, that's the stuff you should plant because it doesn't need very much water if it's out in nature and it's looking great. Okay, so a couple more things. We are going to give you a poll question right now based on how far we've gotten so far today. How likely are you to install your own drip system? And be honest, you're not gonna hurt my feelings because what I say next depends on what your poll answers are. So are you very likely not quite ready yet or not very likely to install your own drip system? Drum roll. Okay, woo, okay. We haven't turned anyone completely off. That's a win. Okay, so not quite ready yet. That's all right, there's more to learn. So hopefully with some of the resources that we share with you guys, I know I have failed at telling the girls to share a bunch of links that I gave them. So hopefully maybe we can just like blah, bullet them all up there when we get done here and lots of resources for you guys to look at that you can do a little bit more reading and maybe you'll feel inspired to jump on board after that. But depends on what kind of incentives you need, right? So first of all, if you need any kind of um, incentive to get started on conserving water in general, I know for Katadi, they have lots of different rebate programs, cash for grass, like I said, they give, I believe it's 50 cents a square, could be more, I'm not sure. In Healdsburg, they give you a buck. So it's pretty right on. And then there's also free water surveys for people to come to your house and help you find things that maybe you could save more water on by offering you know, low flow shower heads or sink aerators, things like that. Um, maybe it's time to um, get rid of the clunker washing machine and get yourself a high efficiency one. So anyway, you might wanna check, um, check out your city's, your water provider's um, conservation page and see if maybe there might be a little boost to get you going that way. Um, another way would be, um, I am teaching a class this fall at Mendocino College. Um, it's called AGR 151, Landscape Irrigation. And if you wanna dive in and learn some more, I teach um, more about drip irrigation. I teach the Quell course. 
I also teach um, about just basic hydraulics, about how water moves through pipes, what size pipe do you need to do what, and um, some fun stuff. There are some in-person labs that who knows, they might get canceled, but I'm super cool about that kind of stuff. Everybody's spread out, you each get your own kit. I'm ready to rock and roll on that one. The other one is Santa Rosa Junior College in the spring. It's basically very similar to the same course. Um, super fun. I love that class. You'll see that I'm I'm more enthusiastic about irrigation than, than I should be. It's almost it's almost weird, I know. So anyway, that's another way. If you're feeling inspired, you need to uh, you need some ins inspiration on what to plant. You might want to visit the savingwaterpartnership.org page on the concept design templates that we have up there. They're absolutely free. They're open source. They have full plan sets, beautiful renderings of what the landscape looks like. Um, if it should be installed, plant lists, irrigation plans, all kinds of really cool stuff. Very well put together and all very, very water wise and gorgeous. So you might want to check that out. If you are saying, you know, I just don't know. I'm not sure if I can do this myself. Or if you are like, no, I'm not doing this, then I would say, okay, maybe it's time to hire a pro that can help you out. So the Qualified Water Fridge and Landscaper Program is a program for landscapers that want to just take it up a notch and are ready to help people figure out uh, sleuthing out their problems, making upgrades to existing systems. Maybe you inherited a system that you have no idea where the bones are connected. Um, you might want to consider hiring a quail professional. So um, there's your there's your options. So um, thanks everybody for listening, and I am ready to take on questions. Really quick before we do questions, uh, we had a couple of slides that we wanted. Oh, to sorry, I'm to. sorry. No, no worries, Chris. <laughs> Just a few more things we wanted to add, uh, and then we will we definitely have time at the end for questions. Um, but thank you all so much for being here today. And I hope you guys, maybe this will give you all a minute to really process what we've just learned and write down a couple of questions. Uh, definitely add those to the question and answer box. Let me get this up really quick. Chris, I'm gonna take over your screen share. So right now at Daily Acts, uh, we are currently in the middle of one of our annual action campaigns. Right now, uh, we are doing the Be the Change campaign, and I wanted to show you guys this quick video uh, about what we've been up to. Transform your life into the vision of the world that you hold in your heart. Get growing plant food and medicine. Find habitat and watch your garden come to life. Improve soil health with compost and a diversity of plants. Speak up, be heard, and make a difference. Write a letter to an elected official. Volunteer your time or donate to a cause that you care about. Obtain and reuse the rain. Transform your thirsty lawn into lunch by sheet mulching. Harvest the power of the sun. <laughs> Meditate, breathe in, and breathe out. Get outside. Take time to admire the beauty that exists around you. You are the change that we need in the world. There are many ways that you can take action today to create a more healthy, just, and climate resilient future. Let your actions today at dailyacts.org and slash be the change. So actually one of our um, one of our categories for this Be the Change campaign is to save water resources. So by installing a drip irrigation system, you're actually excuse me. Um, by installing a drip irrigation system, you're actually completing one of those actions. So we would love if you would take the time to register for our campaign today at dailyx.org slash be the change. And I'm sure Liz will add that into the chat section. Let me just bring up the last of the presentation here. Perfect. So we also want to give a special thank you to our sponsors. We have so many incredible community sponsors that really make all of our work possible. Um, I'd like to give at this moment a special shout out to Wyatt Irrigation that you see there. I know Chris, you know, work, used to work for Wyatt Irrigation and 
They are an absolutely incredible resource. If you go into Wyatt in either Petaluma or in Santa Rosa, you'll get so much help. They're so enthusiastic and they're really knowledgeable and they can really help you with those specific questions you have about your system. So make sure you go and say hi to them and tell them that we sent you. And I did just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for being here today. We really appreciate all the support from our community. If you had any questions, feel free to shoot me an email at serena at dailyacts.org. Um, and now I think we could take your questions. Yeah, we have a few things uh, submitted in the Q&A thus far. One of those first questions came from, Chris, when you mentioned uh, chlorine in city water. And this woman was emphasizing that chlorine is not good for plants. So I guess maybe the question is, will the filter that you demonstrated actually filter out that chlorine uh, well enough so that it's not harmful to plants? And I did, you actually are muted right now, by the way, Chris. Okay, so that's true. I have a swimming pool and I used to have a little guy that swam around and he would spray water outside and he killed a bunch of my plants with the chlorine. But I have extremely high levels of chlorine in my pool compared to a city water system. So yes, there is trace amounts of chlorine in there. Um, a regular filter is not going to get that out. They do make some sort of hose bib and dechlorinating filters that are like a little cartridge and you can change them periodically. Um, I remember, you know, selling them before, but I don't remember like how long they last or what their volume is or anything like that. So if you're concerned about that, that would be um, one possibility would be to try to filter it out that way. Um, you know, aerating it will get rid of the chlorine eventually, but um, that becomes problematic of how do you get it out and then put it back in? You know, you have to have tanks and stuff like that. So, um, so there, I, hopefully that answers your question on that one. Um, do you want me to go down the, the line here? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. If you want to go down that, that's perfect. So does Cloverdale offer incentives? So um, I'm not sure which incentive you're looking for, cash for grass. I believe they do not have a program but if you're on a well, that might be different. So um, depends on what watershed you're in, whether there's any kind of incentives for that. Um, if you want, you can email me and I can look into that for you. Or you can go to um, you can go to our website and check that out also. But you can send me an email and I will try to get to the bottom of that for you. Okay, so Vicki, you have soggy spots in the garden, not above ground leaks. Those I can track down and repair by manually running the system. Mystery leaks. I'm just stumped and frustrated. I sent you a message, but um, you know, are you there when it's running, or is it running when you're not there? So first of all, whenever there's an issue, you should turn it on and see if you can identify it. So with drip systems, you have to. It's kind of a stop, look, and listen thing. For me, when I'm investigating, a, I know there's going to be a problem, but I'm not sure what it is. I turn the system on and I like hurry and run around and like listen, 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 listen to see where it is. Sometimes you might have a leak and it's squirting down instead of up. So it's not really obvious. Um, so um, that could be the problem. Um, it could be, it might be real clay soil. So maybe water's running from one place to another. Um, but I did give you my personal information so we could talk about that a little bit more later. Okay, do I install a backflow preventer before or after the timer unit? Okay, so we did talk about this and the, the thing is, um, we could go out to battle about this one, but I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what. If you go to the manufacturer's website, I have a brass one around here somewhere. If you go to the manufacturer's website, they will tell you, do not put the backflow preventer under static pressure. So static pressure is when water pressure is pushing up against something and no water is running through it. It's just sitting there. So if you have this backflow preventer before this, fill, before this, this timer, this timer has to have water pressure on it all the time so that when it clicks open, water will come through it. So this would be under pressure all the time. Well, it might not fail today and it might not fail tomorrow, but it's gonna definitely fail when you're out of town, right? It's gonna crack and it's gonna have some kind of problem. So you should put the backflow preventer after the timer right here. If you don't have a timer, it's the first thing that goes on after the hose bib. So that's a great question. What do I recommend for organic bug spray? You know, I am not um, certified or very knowledgeable in IPM, but that I believe might be something that Daily Axe has a class on or did. Bugs in the garden? No? 
Okay, new class for you guys to have, IPM on natural. Okay, I don't know that answer. Um, you might have to call your, your ag commissioner or somebody on that one. I'm sorry, I, I don't have the answer for that one. Okay, so I've been seeing these tubing grids and vegetable garden raised beds. What do you think about them? So again, I mean, it depends on what kind you have. The grid gardens are great for being able to calculate how much water there is. They're also great for, you know, basically trying to fill up the entire space with water. Rather than trying to just drip on individual plants, this kind of tubing can be really cool for that. But again, in raised beds, remember, if your soil's really coarse, um, you have to have these, you know, the rows fairly close together, you know, maybe nine to 12 inches apart, so that when these do drip and they want to go straight down, they have time to kind of spread out on the way down. Again, these are limited to distance. Um, this tubing right here is amazing, but they don't make it in shorter than 12 inch spacing. So you might have to curve it around and put the spacing pretty close together, but this is as comfortable as I can make this spin. See, so it starts kinking here. They do make another size in between these two. It's a 12 millimeter. It's a little bit less expensive. It's pretty cool stuff too, but it doesn't have a check valve. So keep that out in mind. Okay, I discovered that white and free cell irrigation parts that don't fit together. Ah, oh, that is perfect. I'm so glad that you brought that up. So here's what you do. First of all, you take a piece of your tubing and you cut it off and you put it in your glove box. So wherever you go, you have this with you and you say, I need something to fit this right here in my hand, right? Or if you're going, you ran out of tubing and you need to go get some more tubing. I need more tubing exactly like this. So put it in your glove box. And if you have any of the brown stuff, put that in there too. That way you have it. So you're right. Um, they do make different sizes. Um, Wyatt is more of a commercial irrigation supply store. So they're going to sell stuff that's more on the commercial side that could possibly carry a little more flow than you would for residential. So Friedman's um, might have a size that's a tiny bit smaller because it's built for more for residential systems. Either one is fine, but one might just have a little bit less friction loss and can carry a little bit more oomph down the way. Okay. Yeah, actually, Liv and I were just at Friedman's the other day and we discovered that Friedman's only sells a half inch for mm. inline stuff. So it's a little bit more limited on like sizing and spacing and that sort of thing. So yeah. if you want to get more specific, you can't really do mm. that. Yeah. Okay, with elevated beds of 12 by 3, would I need to deal with pressure compensating on an embedded emitter scheme? So embedded emitters, um, so this stuff, if you're looking for some good quality stuff, that 12 by 3, that's a pretty tight turn. Um, to answer your question about the pressure compensating, no, they're very short beds. You don't need that. Uh, but this might be a little too stiff to make that three foot turn real great. So you might consider going to netfmusa.com and looking at their other products. It's the tw um, 12 millimeter um, EZ is what they call it. And it's like this, it comes in a six inch spacing too, which is really cool for vegetable beds to get that is a little bit tighter together. So check that out, netfmusa EZ, okay. Once installed, how many years is a system supposed to work? <clears throat> that depends. How cruddy is your water? What kind of critters do you have laying around? Do you have dogs wanting to bite it every time they have it come on? Do you have kids wanting to poke holes in it? So most of it is how accessible is it? Um, if you have really cruddy water, then um, for one, you want to flush it more often. You want to know where the end is, open it up and let her fly more often. Um, to clean it out, but a system should should last for a very long time unless you have filtration issues. Um, if you have really hard water, um, things can clog up. Um, basically, what can happen is this, you can't even see it, this little baby, let me try. Oh, there it is. That little baby hole right there gets a little bit of um, calcium or something on the outside of it, so it's like a slow death where it just starts closing it off, right? So, you know, how do you fix that? So how you fix that is kind of lame, actually. So you, it's hard to, to filter out calcium and iron and things like that. So um, if you use mulch, which you should whenever you can, and you irrigate it 
um, frequently, sometimes for not very long, it keeps it wet right here, keeps it moist around the emitter. And if it's moist around the emitter, it never really dries up. And that seems like a completely lame way to do it. And it is kind of lame, but it is one way to do it. The other way is you can try to flush the ends out more often so that some of that like iron bacteria doesn't grow in it and make it ugly. So <clears throat> it does depend on your particular situation. Okay, ladies, was there anything I forgot? Wow, that no seems pressure. like you really covered it. I, I had my own personal question, but it, I think you might have just addressed it. My question was around uh, well water, but it comes back to that really cruddy water. So in addition to filtration, to flushing that system, uh, if, is there anything else you suggest with that kind of crummy yeah. water? Are there, there any is. sort of like emit? So oh, one, great. you might not want to use this kind of tubing because mm -hmm. it can, you know, you saw what was going on inside of this tube, all that crazy path of uh, the labyrinth that it has to take. So this seems counterintuitive from a, an efficient, from a water conservation perspective, but you just have to know how to balance it. And that is get an emitter with a bigger opening. So if you have a two gallon per hour emitter, somewhere inside of that emitter, it has a bigger opening for two gallons to fit out, right? Versus a half gallon or a one gallon. So if you have really clay soil, then that's going to be all about managing your time. You're not going to be able to run it for very long because you're like putting two gallons an hour down on clay soil. It's going to want to spread out. So you're going to have to irrigate for shorter intervals. But if it has a bigger opening and it has that slow death that's going to happen to it eventually from minerals, you want it to take longer to happen, right? So you would just choose an emitter with a larger flow rate to try to keep its lifespan a little bit longer. Okay, I think that's, that's all I got. Um, so if you, do you have the ability to send everybody the links that I kind of gave you? Yeah, okay. absolutely. Great, okay, cool. And then um, if people have more questions, um, I'm, I'm willing to answer them. I'm not sure the best way to get a hold of me would be. Um, yeah, Chris, if it's okay with you, we can include yeah. your email in the follow-up email that yeah. we're going to send. Um, everyone's going to receive a recording of this webinar. In addition, you'll receive all the links that we sent throughout the webinar, so don't worry about trying to keep track of that. We'll be sending okay, it your great. way additional resources. Okay, that sounds fantastic. Is there any more questions before we go? I think we have, um, it would be better to see you rather than have question marks take up the whole screen. Oh, <laughs> thanks, Beverly. Can we, can we make my face the full screen? <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> we always welcome feedback, so I appreciate that. That's true. I am holding up little tiny things to a little tiny screen. Thank you, everybody, for um, coming today. This has been super fun. I love talking about irrigation and water efficiency, so I'm super glad that Daily Axe reached out to me and asked me to come along. So maybe we'll do another one another time. You tell Daily Axe and have, have me come back. <sighs> Yeah, I'm thinking like bring maybe back. the irrigation troubleshooting one. Uh -huh. That sounds good. Like that. Cool. Vicki will be here. She's got some problems <laughs> down there. <laughs> Love it. Thank you all so much. We'll be following up via email, and it was so great to have you all join us this evening. Thanks, everyone. Take care.